Welcome to Talking With Tech. My name is Chris Bouguet and I'm here with Rachel Madel. Rachel, how's it going? It is going really well. I'm really excited for our interview today, Chris. Did you get to talk to a teacher this time? I did. Her name's Carly Hines and she is actually based out of Liverpool. And I connected with her through Instagram of all places because I was really interested in all of the really exciting things that she was doing to engage all of the AAC users in her classroom. And so I reached out to her and I said, listen, I love what you're doing. I love all of the really exciting things that you, you know, showcase on your Instagram. Would you like to come on, you know, our podcast? And so of course she was really excited and um, I got to talk with her and we talked all about how can we use really motivating things to to get kids engaged. Um, she talks about how her experience as a teacher, she didn't know anything about AAC. And then she had one student who came in with an AAC device and it really propelled her to keep learning more information and um, how, how can I support AAC users? And now she has um, 19 AAC users in, I don't know if it's her classroom or the school that she's working in, but she's learned so much about AAC and she talks about some really practical strategies to implementing. That's awesome. Isn't it funny how those things happen? Like you, your career goes one way and then suddenly something happens. You're introduced to somebody. It changes your whole trajectory. And now she's someone that's on a podcast talking about all their, her different strategies for implementing AAC. That's, that's incredible. So to, to give me a taste, what's one of the, the strategies she talks about? So one of the things that I really loved that she started doing was she does a core word of the week strategy. Um, so she, out, she knows about core words and the importance of them. And she sends out an email every week to all of the staff, all of the teachers, all of the parents uh, for the following week. Here's the, the word of the week that we're going to focus on. Um, you know, here are some very specific books that you can use, specific activities that you can use. And what I was telling her is that I love that she personalizes this. I think that there's a lot of resources out there, assistive wear and all of these things that where you can get core word of the week and you can get handouts to send home. But I think that part of the problem is that, you know, we're so inundated with information. So when you get a, a handout or a worksheet and it feels kind of like it was cut out of a book or uh, it feels like a template almost, um, I think a lot of times you're not as engaged or you're not as excited to read it. And so just making a small shift and personalizing it, um, maybe even cutting and pasting it from some of the resources that you have, but then personalizing it to the specific students that you're working with. Think about how much more engaging that is. If I see, you you know, if I'm a parent and I'm reading something and I see my child's name, all of a sudden I'm like, oh, perfect. Um, you know, oh, this might get Joel excited or this might get, you know, so-and-so, um, you know, this would be a great activity for them. All of a sudden I'm, I'm more interested and motivated to read the entire thing. Oh, I love that. You know, first of all, I was just showing the assistive wear core curriculum website that has all those resources to teachers just like last week. And so one great resource for people. But the, what you're saying here is how she tailors it and makes it special for each individual. Uh, and that makes people more apt to use it than just some sort of, sort of boilerplate template. I, I love that. Right. Yeah. And I also think it's really interesting because um, as a teacher and as, you know, the person probably who knows the most about her students and their level of communication and what kinds of things that they're working on with their devices, it's really great for all of the teachers to read about all of the students. Um, and so everybody kind of knows, oh, so-and-so loves this. This might be a good activity for them, or this is where this student's at. Um, so I think just having a little bit of an update on um, and specific uh, specifics for each student is just such a great idea. Um, and then of course we talked about these things take time, right? And so she said in the beginning, it was so hard because she spent a lot of time on these emails. She's like, but now, you know, some of the, the words of the week I'm using from last year. So there's a lot of overlap. Um, and she's like, now it takes me hardly any time at all um, because I kind of know what I'm doing and I know what I want to say. And um, so it's just, I think it's a, it's an important thing to remember that anything that you start doing will take more time initially, but then once you get used to doing it, time flies when you already know what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I have a very similar story. There was a teacher that uh, was wanting to have a communication bridge that went home between you know school and home. So classic communication bridge is probably a composition notebook where people write at school, I did this. And then it goes home and the parents might write at home, we did this. And it goes back and forth with questions and things like that. I think that's probably a standard practice in a lot of schools for, for students. Um, and what he wanted to do was to digitize that so that he could have a record of how often, I mean, you have a record in the composition notebook, but he wanted to be able to take that data and, and say, 
He didn't have to count up each page when it got to progress note time and parse through all that. He wanted it all digitally so he could do it much quicker and have the computer help him do that. So he, and he thought it would be easier for parents who were, where's that composition notebook? I left it at home. Oh, did we make it back in the, in the backpack? But everyone has their phones, right? So if it was just a link that they could fill out on their phones. And so what he did is that he made a communication bridge using a Google form, just a small, uh, short Google form with a student's name. It's secure because they, it's a Google school shared the link with the, with the parents, and then he fills it out every afternoon after school uh, so the parents can see the, what happened at school today and also links homework or some sort of resource that he's created or something they use today at school and says, you know, go check out this YouTube video or go check out this um, Tar Heel Reader book or something like that. Uh, Tar Heel Reader is a book that it's a, it's a website that has digital books. So it, then the parents would then fill out the same link about what they did that night because, yeah, we completed the homework. We read that Tar Heel Reader book. Uh, I wasn't very interested or, yes, he was very interested, that kind of feedback. And then it just populated because it's a Google form. It populated it all in a spreadsheet, which, again, he could share with any teacher. He could uh, use it as transition for, for the following year. Here's everything that happened. He had all of his progress notes and data in there. We, I corresponded with the parent 15 times or 20 times this, this semester. You know, he could just put it all in one place for it. And it sounds sort of like it's just a, another good idea that I think people could run with out there. Uh, that sounds similar to what Carly's doing, which is customizing it for individual people. Yeah. The other thing that I have seen and have done with some of the clients that I work with is the parents will start a shared iCloud album. And so the parent will share pictures of the child at OT, the child in the community, the child doing all types of things um, with comments, you know, use device to say so-and-so. Um, and, and, and I love it because you're actually able to comment on those photos. Um, so you can kind of say like, oh, you know, next time try this. Um, a lot of times I'll be, um, I'll be sent videos or things like that of little portions of ABA sessions or occupational therapy sessions, um, all different kinds of sessions. And I'm able to, to coach um, those practitioners by commenting. You know, I really love the way that you modeled go, um, you know, next time before so-and-so gets up um, to go to the swing, it's another great opportunity to model that. Um, so it's just, that's an example of how you can use technology like iCloud photo albums. Um, I've also seen very similar things with Vimeo um, and YouTube password protected channels. So you can just upload a quick video. Um, I think that technology is so cool. We're able to learn so much information from such a short clip, um, a short video clip. It would take, you know, an hour maybe to write an email that encompassed all of the strategies and all of the things that we observed. Um, so in just, you know, 30 seconds, you can watch a short video and see exactly what's happening. I, I don't think we can emphasize enough the point that you made earlier too, that it might take a little bit to learn how to do that. Well, I don't know Google Forms or I don't know. I could, you could really easily defeat yourself by just saying you don't know that. But if you spent a little time learning the, how to share photos in an iCloud uh, shared environment or, or put them in Google or wherever you do it, whatever you want to do, spending that time, that upfront time can save you so much time in the back end. Uh, like you said, writing an email that takes an hour instead of doing a 30 second video, it saves you so much time. So it's worth spending investing that time in upfront because it's going to save you so much in the back end. I agree. Um, you just mentioned email, Chris, and it's the bane of my existence. I hate email and my email gets so overwhelming. I have all of the clients in my practice. I have all these social media friends and followers who are constantly asking me questions via email. And so one of the hacks that I've started using is it's a website called Loom, L-L-O-M. And I might've talked about this already on the podcast, but I'm going to emphasize it again because I'm obsessed with it. Um, essentially, it's a way to quickly record uh, videos so I can can take a video of myself, um, I can take a video of my screen, or I can take a video of my screen and myself. And what's nice about it is that a free website, but you, you can show people on your screen. Um, so sometimes I will broadcast my iPad screen to my computer 
and then I'll do a loom. So if I'm trying to show somebody, for example, um, you know, how to get to a certain word or how to program a new word or something, you know, tech related, uh, it's so much easier to just send them a short video and show them exactly how to do it. Um, and you could use loom for that because I think part of the problem with video, even if it's just a short video, like 60 seconds or something like that, it still takes a lot of space. The nice thing about loom is that you don't need any space. You just send a link and it goes all through the website. Um, so as soon as you're done recording your screen, you hit stop and it says copy link and you can literally paste it into an email and you're off, you're running um, and you don't have to store it anywhere, which is my issue with video is that if I take a video on my phone and then I try and share it, it's oftentimes saying it's too big and needs to send with through Google drive or all of these other places. So that's my, um, that's my hack. I love it. I couldn't agree more with the video. I mean, I use that strategy all the time. I mean, for instance, there's something called the new voice software that you can get for free from PRC if you're using one of those systems. And it's free software, but it takes a little bit to set it up for people that aren't familiar with uh, how to use it. And so just made a quick little video here. Let me show you how to download it. We from our like on our, on our school website. We have the software loaded in a special place and so that people can go get it, right? And so it's different than it is out on, on the, the World Wide Web. And so how, hey, teachers are like, how do we go get these materials? Well, again, I can write a long email explaining how to get these materials, or I can just do a 10, 15 second video that shows if you click here and you click here, you can download that software, install it, here's how you set it up, and boom, you're good to go. So I couldn't agree more. Loom sounds like awesome, awesome tool. And the other nice thing is that you only have to do it once because then you have a video of how to go to that website and click on the materials or whatever it might be. So I just love the, the automation aspect of it because I can do something one time and then I have that. So if I'm trying to add a button on Proloquo, I only have to do that video one time. Um, you also can password protect it. So sometimes I will, um, if a parent sends me a long email, which I get a lot of long emails with like 10 questions, it's like, well, they did this and then what should I do? And you know, school says maybe we should add these words to the device. And it's just like, it's so much, it's very overwhelming. So what I'll do is I'll just loom a video back. So and it'll just be me and I'll just say, Hey, I just got your email. You know, I want to answer some of the questions that you had. And it's so much easier to just say those things instead of I, I, emails take me forever to write. Um, and mm -hmm. so I just, I've been using it all the time to respond to, you know, emails, especially clinical ones. And I love it because you can password protect it. So, you know, you can send the video and then in a separate email, I'll say, I just sent you a video. Here's the password. And it's just a really, you know, great way to keep in touch with families and answer questions that, you know, families have. I also have SLPs who are asking me lots of questions. So it's just a really quick way to, to answer and give a lot of content um, without a lot of time. So speaking about emails there, Rachel, so I think we're planning on having a, somewhere in the future, having a listener feedback episode because we've been having quite a bit of discussions going on on the Facebook group. People are posting questions there. We've, if you've sent us emails, we're getting those. Uh, it's just getting to record them and the answers and, and plot them into the right episodes. So we thought maybe we'll put all of those together. We, we are collecting them all and we're putting them all in one shared location for, for us to look, look at. And then we are going to answer all those questions and talk about all of them, everything that's happening on the Facebook group and in the emails in a future listener feedback episode like we've done in the past. Yeah. So if you guys haven't joined our Facebook group, please head over to Facebook, join the Facebook group um, and ask questions. I'm so excited to see the questions that we're getting in there. Um, I wish I had more time to you know, respond to all of them, but that was kind of the, the reason that we decided to do this listener feedback episode is because we want you to know that we do want to answer all these questions. Um, so keep them coming and we're going to dedicate an entire episode to them so that we can get to them and give them the time and the discussion that they all deserve. Also, if you haven't checked it out yet, we have a course over at Exceptional Ed. You can check it out at bit.ly slash TWTCorePD. Rachel, tell everyone about the course. It's really exciting. So we decided that we're going to start turning our podcasts into professional development courses. So basically you listen to the podcast and then if you want to earn CEUs for this, you have to go to Exceptional Ed. You can go to that bit.ly link um, and it will direct you to the Exceptional Ed website. You simply answer 10 questions and then you get a, an hour CEU. Um, so it's $25 per course. Um, our first course is of course on core words, which is a really essential skill when you're thinking about AAC implementation. Um, but we plan on having a lot more courses coming up. So if you're interested in checking it out, you can go to bit.ly slash TWT core PD to check out the course. And then without further ado, here's Rachel's interview with Carly Hines.
Do you have an idea for a product or book? Or are you ready to go beyond in-service presentations? Well, how do you get started? And what if you don't have any business experience at all? I'm Mailing Chan, and I'm getting the nitty-gritty stories from parents, teachers, therapists, advocates, and people with disabilities who have created successful businesses, and they're sharing their intimate stories with you. Listen to us on the Exceptional Leaders Podcast and fast-track creating and building and sharing your idea with the world so that you can help more people. Welcome to Talking With Tech. I'm your host, Rachel Madel. I'm so excited to be joined by Carly Hines today. She's based out of the UK. Carly, how are you doing? Hello, I'm fine, thank you. Yeah, I'm really excited to have Carly here today. She is a teacher um, and she's based out of uh, Liverpool, correct, Carly? That's right, yep. Yeah, and I actually found her through social media. Um, I was just really impressed with the kinds of activities that she was showcasing that she uses to engage um, her AAC learners. And I reached out and was like, listen, we'd love to have your perspective on our podcast. Um, And she was kind enough to agree. So Carly, can you just start off by explaining to everybody what you do and how you got, you know, into working with kids with complex communication needs. Absolutely. Yeah, no problem at all. Um, So I trained to be an early years teacher um, a long, long time ago. And um, I did that for five years and then got a job in the school that I'm in at the moment, which is Sandfield Park um, in 2012. Um, And I worked there in the sixth form department for a year. And then the year after that, I was moved down to the year seven um, group. And um, as part of the transition for moving children from primary school to secondary school. So in the UK, we do that at age 11 to age 12. So the year six is, is in primary school, year seven is in secondary school. So they start with us in year seven. Um, and as part of it, we had a young lady called Faye who arrived into the school. She has um, cerebral palsy, complex communication needs, and she's also a power wheelchair user. Mm-hmm. Um, and she arrived with a VMAX, which now looks absolutely huge and archaic and looks like it should be, should be in a museum. And she was using Interact software, which is even more archaic and looks like that should be a museum as well. And the only point of reference I had at that point was Stephen Hawking and thought, well, you know, something needs to happen here. I don't know anything about this. Um, I've watched the theory of everything, but other than that, don't really know what's going on. And in order to be um, the best teacher for Faye and you know, support her to become the best version of herself by the time she leaves us in nine, at 19, I'm going to need to do some reading and research um, around what this thing is that's attached to her wheelchair. Um, so I asked some pre- preliminary questions to her learning support assistants who came with her. Um, and the school that she came from is um, Springwood Heath, which is the CAT team are based there, which is the um, Liverpool Communication Alternative Augmentative Technology team. And we support lots of children around Liverpool who have complex communication needs by going in and supporting our mainstream colleagues um, for children whose speech and language therapy would like us to go in and work alongside. So they were very keen for me to know all the work that they'd done with Faye and make sure that that was being continued. Um, So I sought some extra help, sought lots and lots of training, went on all the courses that I could. Um, We have a really supportive head who appreciates that communication comes before education because until you know how to communicate and tell your teacher that you know what they're saying and that they're not just talking for the sake of talking and you're just smiling and nodding and looking nice. You know, we can't really assess the pupils. We can't really see what they're doing. We don't know whether they've made progress. We don't know whether they're just arriving in school and spending six and a half hours staring at us or whether they're actually taking it in. And it might be that they know everything that we're saying, but just can't get it out. So we really need to support them to be able to do that um, so that we can be the best teachers we can be in order to support the students as well as we can do. Um, so that, that's where my, my journey started. Um, and then since then, we've had 19 AAC users through the door. 18 at the peak, which was last year. We've gone down to 17 this year because two two children left us last year to go to college, which in itself was um, a learning curve because we've never transitioned anyone with an AAC device to college before. So that that came with a few bumps in the road. Um, but that's that. Yeah, that that's where we. So we we started our journey in May 2015, and we're now January 2019. Um, we don't know everything. We try our best. 
um, lots of things don't work um, and we do all the reading that we can and all the research that we can in order to to know what we're doing and wing it quite a lot of the time. <laughs> I think that, you know, I think we're all kind of winging it a lot of the time, yeah. especially with AAC because there's so much to know and there's so much, you know, variability between clients. Yes. And so you yeah. can know all the things and all the research. Um, first of all, there's gaps in the research, right? Um, there's yeah. some areas where we definitely need more research, but it's so individualized and yeah. you, you can take all that knowledge, but then how do you integrate it and make it meaningful for a child and um, translate into actual, you know, communication that happens. Mm, absolutely. Well, we, we've, we've found that there's, there's, you know, you can go on all of the courses and you can do all of the research. Um, I, uh, two, two years ago, um, was lucky enough to get one of my learning support assistants off timetable, which means she wasn't supposed to be in the room and doing the learning support assistant role. Um, and she got a, a, a new title as of communication assistant. And then last year we got another one as well. So I have two fantastic communication assistants called Cara and Libby. Um, and their job and their role is to go and get the children a, a, a little bit like a speech and language therapist in that they provide intervention and then step back. Um, so they go and get the children, take them out of, I take them out of class, go and do some intensive core word work um, for half an hour, twice a week. And then for an hour, once a week, they go into class and support the child child in whatever they're doing, whatever lesson it is, just so that they can see the functional purpose of communication and see whether there's any way they can weave that core word into what that child's doing in that lesson. And then once a week, they also have a communication group with another AAC user who is either using the same type of communication strategies that they are, or is at the same level of communication and wanting to talk socially or, or that type of thing. Um, so they, um, so they do that. Um, so they support me and all of the AAC users, as well as all of the teachers as well. But, you know, one of the things that we've said is we go on all of these courses and we see all these fantastic things happening. And then you bump back down to reality and go, when have I got the time to do that? Where am I going to time to find all of those resources, make them laminate them, cut them out, put it into practice when you have limited time. There's only so many hours in the day. <laughs> Absolutely. I guess, exactly. I think we're all, we all have way too much work to do and not enough time. Um, <laughs> so for those teachers who, you know, might be listening to this podcast thinking, oh my gosh, I would love to do these things. Um, where, what's a good starting place? What's a, a place for when people feel overwhelmed or teachers who are new to AAC? What are some easy things that you can start doing right away that can help support AAC in the classroom? Well, we've taken a couple of strategies. We've we've taken the core word classroom approach and adjusted it to make it fit our, our purposes. So we've looked at the um, looked at the, the the core word classroom that I downloaded was from Teachers Pay Teachers from the speech and language ladies, I think it was. And um, obviously the timetable over in America is vastly different than ours over here because the days that you're in school and also um, the terms are different. So we edited it to make it fit um, our term time. And then we looked at the core words that we wanted to teach the children and had a little look at where they might fit. So for example, we did the word give the week before Christmas because we would probably be talking about what we're going to give as presents. And we did eat and drink the week we got back after Christmas because everybody talks about what they've been eating and drinking. So it's just a case of trying to find a topic that you're already doing. There is no point in reinventing the wheel. No one wants to do extra work. Nobody wants to complete extra paperwork. Look at what you're already doing and just have a little look at where you can fit a tiny little bit of AAC in. And when I'm doing my training for parents and staff, I always say, just start with one word. If you're saying a sentence, just find one word within that sentence on the device. And I'm saying to the parents, take the device home and think to yourself, what's the first thing I'm going to say to my kid in the morning? Is it good morning? Is it I love you? Or is it what you want to have for breakfast? And whatever it is, practice it when they're in bed. Take the device, play with it, learn where all the words are, learn about putting vocabulary together, see how hard it is, see how long it takes for them. Because you need to understand and appreciate that when they're trying to get their message across to you, that you need to wait that amount of time. And if you, as you know, an adult with no physical disability and no learning disability, take 30 seconds to put a sentence together, you're going to need to leave longer than that for your child. You know, we, we have we have children who who have physical disabilities who you can see that they're desperate to try and make that contact with their finger, but sometimes their body just won't let them do it. Um, and we need to be mindful of that and aware and, and sort of give them the support of just sitting there and waiting. So yeah, I would say start small, model one core word, 
leave loads of wait time and be kind to yourself. There's a lot of language to learn. And even those of us who can speak verbally don't know every single word that there is available to us at any one time. Um, language is evolving. You know, if you look at the Oxford Dictionary of all of the new words that they've brought in this, this year, um, I think it was released last year. I had a look at them. Some of them, I have no idea what they mean. So it's all about, you know, teaching children language in the, in there and then and what you're doing and find something that they're interested in. There's no point in modeling something that they're looking out of the window and you really want them to look at that work on the sheet or whatever. It has to be something that they're interested in. Otherwise it doesn't work. Exactly. And we can't just teach in a silo, right? We have yeah. to integrate and that's, it's the easiest way and it's the most effective way, you know, find something that's already happening. How can we integrate language into that? Um, and I love the core word of the week. We've talked a lot on the podcast about how it's a really great approach because like you said, you give, you give parents and you give maybe new communication partners one word to focus on. And it's amazing how many different circumstances um, you can think of to use one word. Um, yes. If you give five words, it's, it's, not, it's not as effective. One, because a lot of times people are overwhelmed. There's a lot of you know, training it takes and, and learning it takes to learn where all these words are. Even though you might know how to use it, you're like, oh, where, did, where is this exact word? Um, and so I think that you know, not only does it make it less overwhelming, but it really forces you to think outside the box when you're trying to think of clever and innovative ways to use a single word. So I just, I think the core word of the week is a really great one. And I love how you are strategic about it, saying give right before the holidays, because what yeah. people are giving presents and they're giving a lot of things. Um, you know, is that something you sit down with your team and say, okay, let's just like map this out for the year. Do you kind of do it as it comes up? Like how, what's the process behind that? I, I can't take any credit for that this year. Um, Cara and Libby did that for me. Last year, we very much did it on a throw words down on the table and see where they land on the calendar. And that's when we'll do it. Right. Um, and then this academic year in September, when we sat down, Cara and Libby mapped it out for me. And they said, this is why we've put this, this, this word here. This is why we've put this word here. Worked out to absolutely perfectly. And um, there was one week where I think we'd got a five week month rather than a four week month or something like that, where we did just a little bit of a diary error. So we just had to work out which one of those two words was was the most important for us and you know within the context of that week is it valentine's day should we be talking about this or should we be talking about this and whatever the two words were we sort of weighed it up having a look at the calendar seeing what's going on are there any festivals coming up is there anything happening in school that we're likely to be doing you know is that we have um, a festival called Sandfest every year where the children perform so if they have peripatetic music lessons or if they have um or if they go to beatboxing some of them go to dj club some of them go to rock band some of them go to dance club so it's an opportunity for them all to perform so having a look at the school calendar as well as sort of a more general calendar and you know if it's something like Diwali we might be looking at light which means we should probably do the words on and off because we're probably going to be talking about light switches um, so just trying to pave the path of least resistance for everybody because mm -hmm. if you're going to be talking about it anyway during that week you might as well capitalize on that and really and use it well so it is a thought out process and we looked at last year's core word of the week and we looked at which words we thought actually all of our children really do know how to use that. We don't need to cover that again. Um, some of the words that perhaps those skills aren't finely honed, they aren't generalizing them, they aren't using them across lots of different places with different people. So we need to do that again. And we've got three weeks spare. So which words should we use? And then we just had a look through some, some core word documents and thought, of, oh, we haven't, we haven't done that one. Let's do that one um, and see, see where it fits in. So yeah. And every week I send an email to all the parents and all the teachers. And um, the first bit is, this is the core word of the week. Um, this is what the symbol looks like PCS. This is what the symbol looks like widget. This is what the symbol looks like um, symbol sticks. Um, this is why we use this word in everyday life. So um, I pulled some stuff from the assistive wear core word classroom, pulled some stuff from Liberator's paperwork, and I pulled some stuff from Toby Dynavox's pathways. Um, and some of them have a brilliant paragraph already there. And then I have taken a screenshot of every child's homepage. Um, and then that goes on the PDF behind. So everybody doesn't have an excuse, no parent, no teacher, no member of staff has an excuse that they don't know where that word is on that child's device. So it's a six page PDF that goes out each week and it has a red circle 
circle around where that word is. So we have some children that are using the same page set on Proloco to go. So I just put three names next to it. This is where it is. Some children have very specialized page sets. And obviously with pod, you have to show which page you're going to um, and sort of put a circle around that. So that, that's a little bit of a longer process. Um, and then underneath there, there is books to read that I've got that focus on that core word, activities to play. Um, so we have a, a box full of games in the um, in the AAC room and we sort of try and make sure that they're available for anybody who wants to play any of those games at any point. And also scenarios in which you might want to use these words at home and at school with real life examples. So if the word of the week is give, we could have, you know, in a PE lesson, give me the ball. In a music lesson, I really like that. Could you give me the keyboard, please? Um, I'm giving you the cake in cookery. Um, can you give me a knife and fork in the hall? Just to try and really focus people's attention in that even if they get waylaid and they think, I just don't know what I'm doing here. I don't know how to how to support these AAC users. There's even just at least one thing on a crib sheet that they, they can do um, and try and break it down and make it as easy as possible for everybody to succeed. Absolutely. And I think that that was one of the questions that I had. Um, how do you manage children who are using all different types of devices and vocabulary? And I think this is a really great way, um, you know, core word of the week, obviously, but I really like the PDF. Um, I like it because it's customized, you know, and there's a, a lot of great resources, you know, assistive wear and all of these, you know, resources that you mentioned are really fantastic. But I think part of the problem is when you get something that feels like a, a cutout, you sometimes glaze over, you might not read it. Um, whereas if you get a personalized email, right? And you're sending out a personalized email that has real examples that could actually be used because, you know, some of, some of the things on some of these resources, they have to kind of do a blanket approach because some of their learners are emerging and some of their learners might be more advanced. Um, so I just, I like the idea of a personalized PDF, um, with things that, you know, pretty much everything could be applicable to your child um, or yeah. the children that you're working with. It seems like a very subtle thing, right? But I think that the, the personalization piece makes people more apt to engage with it, read it. And I just, I love that you're doing that every week. You know, I'm sure when you first started, it kind of took a lot of time, but maybe now it's, it's coming a little bit more quickly. Yes. Um, I mean, obviously everything takes a long time in the beginning. Um, right. And when I first started doing it, I was doing it from a blank canvas because I just thought this needs to happen. I need to tell people what the, what the core word of the week is. You know, we've got symbols on our lanyards with core words on. We now have three display boards around school, one which is right in the center as you walk down the main thing of school, which is a very lucrative um, display board. I don't quite know what I did to be able to deserve that, but it was, it was a maths one. And I was like, can I have that? And can you have the one that I've got? And Luke was like, yeah, that's fine. I was like, oh, Oh, I wasn't expecting that. And everyone has to pass it. There's no, unless you were Spider-Man and you scaled the ceilings, there is no way you can, you can walk past it and miss it. I um, love it. So we change the core word of the week every week. We have a thought of the week, which is usually a funny meme. So that draws the eye. Um, and then around that, we've got um, each of the children what their device is, where they have it, a picture of them and how it's positioned, because you wouldn't believe the number of times that children come in and, and you know, their, their AAC devices upside down and inside out on the mount and definitely not safe. Or they've got a, a device which is in their bag and a photograph of them on the board says, this is what I should look like. It should be around my neck all of the time. If you see me without it, you need to challenge that and find out where it is. So that that's sort of the main board as you walk in. So that gets changed weekly. Um, the, when I first started writing um, the word of the week email, it was, you know, it was, it was taking me an hour or so because I was just writing as I spoke. Um, but now after sort of pulling lots of different things together and, and really, I, I'm, I'm now redoing some words from last year, um, which after having a couple of children leave and a couple of children start and a couple of children who were in our school already starting to use AAC. And now that I've got a little bit more knowledge than I had last year, not that much, just a little, um, a little bit more knowledge than I had last year for that word. There is other examples or when I've just been reading a book with my friend's children and I've gone, oh, this is a really good book and quickly Amazon 
put that on the thingy, um, email that to the finance, um, finance man and ask him to buy one for me um, and then put that into my sort of database of the next time I'm doing the word go, this is a good book um, because you can't always read Go Dog Go. Um, <laughs> so if, you know, exactly. if, if I can find another book that has the same thing, then that would be really useful because otherwise the children are like, oh God, here she comes again. Not again. Not again. <laughs> Oh, I can totally relate. And I know our <laughs> listeners can relate to that too. <laughs> so, um, yes, it, it, you know, it took, it took a long time in the beginning, but now, now when I sort of know that I've got something to go off, obviously working from something that you've already got is easier than starting from scratch. Mm-hmm. Um, so when it's that now it's not, it's taking me five or 10 minutes each week to do that, which is I think manageable and I'm very happy to do it because if it means that and that the people that I'm emailing it to now are sort of the people in the office, the nurses, the physiotherapists, they're getting involved, they're coming to me. I've had just someone today, um, Nicola, one of the physio assistants came to me today and was telling me how well Dylan had been doing in his physio intervention and how he'd been telling her that his leg was hurting and they wanted to go on the physio ball. Um, and, you know, had we not been working very closely with physio to make sure that all of the vocabulary that they might need would be on there, but also encouraging the physios to let them use their devices in there and encouraging them to talk using them whilst they're doing something physical, which isn't that easy. You know, it's positioned perfectly when they're sitting in their wheelchair. It's been done by wheelchair services and an AAC expert on positioning and then as soon as that's taken off and as soon as they're not in their wheelchair you know it's that sort of like you're waving it around like where where do I need to hold this for you where's best for you should I stand it up should I put it on a table should I put it over there which is out of your reach so having having people who are really supportive of of our AAC users is really really important because it means that they know that you know in the middle of a physio intervention they need to say you know is this all right is it hurting do you need more of a stretch is it tight do you want to not be on the wedge do you want to go on the achiever bed do you want to go in the standing frame and knowing that the children have the capabilities and functionalities to be able to do that it just makes everyone's life easier because it means that you're not trying to be telepathic all of the time and looking around the room and going is somebody thirsty is somebody hot you know did she have a good night's sleep last night did her dad shout at her does, does he want to go home, you know, and knowing they have the capabilities of saying that makes my job easier because it means I can get back to teaching rather than just guesswork all the time. Absolutely. I think that's such an important thing to remember. And I really love how you're just utilizing the entire school, right? I think that a lot yeah. of times we, we, I think we have the best intentions as SLPs and as AAC specialists, and we go into these classrooms, but you know, it's, it's sometimes challenging to get everybody else on board and, you know, everyone's pressed for time and it's it's somewhat of a challenge. Um, So what would you say is one of the best strategies to make it a whole school approach versus, you know, just a classroom or just one therapist? How do you make it more integrated across disciplines? Um, I try to make myself available when I'm walking down the corridors and not be in a hurry um, and see opportunities and step in and offer support. I don't know whether my colleagues would agree with that. I think I'm stepping in and offering support or hmm. being there. That might might not translate. Um, I think that that's what I'm doing. Um, so just seeing opportunities and saying, oh, you, you could use the device to do that. Or, oh, have you thought about just stepping around and having a look at how they use it? And, oh, did you know that they can answer that? You know, you don't need to ask them a yes or no question. You don't need to say, do you want to go here or here? Because you can just say, where do you want to go? And they, they can tell you. So I think that not uh, not last year, but the year before, we had a, a twilight set aside for sort of like an AAC update. And Cara and Libby do a lot of filming during their interventions because um, obviously we need evidence, hard, cold, numerical facts mm-hmm. because we're at school to support why we've got two LSAs off timetable who are now communication assistants and delivering these AAC interventions and supporting the children. Um, so sometimes the quantifiable data is more important and actually qualitative data is quite interesting. And, you know, just that, that moment in the staff room where someone goes, oh, did you know that such and such did this last night? They told me. And I'm like, how did they tell you that? That's amazing. Um, so videoing the children and videoing them interacting with staff in much the same way as those videos going on social media and being shared is useful for staff who perhaps don't have that much to do with that specific child because they don't teach them. They may be on lunch duty and they may have the opportunity to spend half an hour outside where they may want to chat to them to know what the capabilities are, you know, how much they can do, what they like to talk about, what their dislikes are. And also to say, 
this is where they're up to, this is what they can currently do. We'd really like it if those people who are walking up and down the corridor who are interacting with this child could do this, could not stop them to talk to them. We have we have um, a, a young young man in my class called Dylan who um, uses his left hand to drive his wheelchair and operate his AAC device. So my sort of catchphrase is he can't walk and talk at the same time. He can yeah. only do one or the other. And if it's break time and you stop him to talk about how Everton did last night, you are going to cause a bottleneck and everyone behind him can't get outside. So go outside, wait till there's a little bit of space and then engage him in conversation. So just little things like that at staff meetings and twilights and what have you and telling people where the children are up to, celebrating successes, showing, you know, this time last year they, they were on a two word independent. Now, you know, they can make a whole sentence and it's got all of the functions and it. it's got a pronoun it's got a time connective it shows you where it's got a descriptive word it's got an action word you know and it's more interesting and they can do it more independently um so sort of getting that buy-in of people going oh actually i think that what she's doing is working yeah she's not just you know doing it for the sake of <laughs> for the sake of doing it um and you know making sure that that i can make other people's jobs easier because that's that's the whole aim of the game you know that if if, if somebody looks ill and they're green around the gunnels and the nurses have got to do 120 questions to find out what it is, that's not a good, good use of their time. It's not a good use of the child's time because they're sitting there going, I'm really ill. I don't want to keep answering these questions. So just making being being confident in knowing that the children can, can advocate for themselves. That's how we get people on board. That's how we get the parents on board. That's how I get the physios on board. That's how I get you know people on board. But these kids can do what, what they want to do. They can say what they want to say on their own, if you support them, if you give them enough wait time, if you know how to help them with their, with their device, if there's a problem, if you know that, you know, if they look a little bit lost, you could say, you know, can you find another word for it? Can you say it another way? Do you need a little bit of help? Should we go and find Miss, Miss Hines? Should we go and find Miss McAndrew? Um, and sort of knowing that, that there's three of us there that, that people can turn to, you know, we are, we are always getting stopped on the corridors. Can you just show me where this word is? And that's a really nice culture to be in that, you know, we, we aren't expecting everybody to be perfect. We're not perfect. And people watching us use the search facility on the, on the apps is, is helpful because it, it just goes to prove that we're not perfect. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. And I'm always telling, you know, parents that especially, you know, I don't know where every word is on this device. Um, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of devices swirling around in my head. Um, and I think just being open. And I also think it's a really great opportunity when you're working with a student, you know, if it's, it's like, Oh, I think that, you know, you want, um, you want to be finished um, and figuring out where that word is. And that's not a good example because that's, that's a core word. It should be on the homepage. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's a lot of value in doing kind of a, a think aloud with a child. Yeah. Like, hmm, like we're looking for a horse. That's probably in the things folder. And I think that's an animal. And, you know, walking through that process, um, I think is important for both, you know, communication partners and for students. Um, yes. So I, I just love that. And I also, it just sounds like you're creating in your school a culture of inspiration, uh, which I think is so important because if you, if you focus on the positives, there's so much great momentum that you can get um, from that optimism and just taking a small amount of your time to talk to all of the people that have potential interactions with a child. Uh, because a lot of times people are very willing and open to learning. They just don't have um, the information. They don't have the knowledge. They, they feel maybe overwhelmed. They've never talked with you know, a student who has complex communication needs. Um, so I think just making yourself available is a, a really good strategy. And then of course, making everybody's job easier, like who doesn't want their job to be easier? Um, <laughs> so I think that's a good way to frame it when you're working with teachers, um, is listen, how can I make your life easier? And that's what yeah. I often will sell, say to teachers when I walk in the door, I say, if I had a magic wand, what, and I could change something, what would it be, um, for this student? And sometimes it has to do with communication. Sometimes it doesn't, but it gives me a good idea as to what the motivating factors are and how I can help, um, and I think if you show up and you're like, listen, I want to help you. Um, I think that's a really good starting off point to build yeah. really good rapport with, you know, the people that you're working alongside of. And um, I think it just opens the door for a lot of learning and collaboration. Mm, absolutely. But also realizing that as, as a teacher, someone walking in and saying to me, if you have, if I had a magic wand, what could I do? 
from a teacher's perspective, that obviously takes the onus off us and goes, brilliant, she's going to sort it all out for me. But then after, after, you know, a couple of minutes of dialogue and saying, well, what, how are we going to break that down? How are you going to do that? Because I'm only going to be here for half an hour or three quarters an hour, you know, an hour a week. And then you're going to have to do this. And then they go, oh, oh, okay. So, so the work is back on me and I do need to do, you know, th- there's going to be, there's, there's got to be a little bit of give and take. And, and it's important for, you know, anybody with a, anybody who has a pie in the sky idea and wants this to happen, you know, want to win the lottery. Well, how's that going to happen? I'm going to have to go out and buy a lottery ticket, which I don't actively do. Um, you know, so saying, saying to somebody, you know, what could I do to help you? You know, if it's not something that you've already put the groundwork in for and you've not seen what the child's receptive language level is, if you've not tried to use a couple of symbols, if you've not used a communication board to try all of those things before somebody comes in to talk to you and say, how can I support you? You aren't going to know what they can do to help you really, are you? Um, So having having a background knowledge of of knowing what the person who's coming in, whoever that is, if it's a physiotherapist, if it's an um, occupational therapist, speech and language therapist, um, you know, knowing knowing what you want and having a couple of targets is is really, really important. And target setting is something that that we do in school just so that we've got something to work towards and something that we can quantify. Um, Because I am, you know, a teacher and I do have to make quantifiable data and I do have to show that they're making progress and I do have to report that to the governors um, and you know, that, that's something that communication and learning how to socially interact with some, some, somebody else is something that a person who can speak is never assessed against. So it's really difficult to sort of prove that what we're doing is working and is valuable um, because I can't write down, Louis asked me if I had a nice weekend because it doesn't hit any of his targets, you know, his targets. Right. Um, so, but that's, that's lovely. And, you know, or what are you doing this weekend or nice dress or did you have your hair cut? You know, they're, they're the type of thing that you just flippantly answer to a, a child who can, who can speak to you. But when one of our AAC users comes in and starts saying things like that, you're like celebrating it. It's a huge deal because it is. Um, and they're the types of things that you really want to sort of write down on a post-it and keep because that's the type of thing that you're very likely to forget because you just want to numbers, boxes, make sure that everything's, you know, T's are crossed, I's are dotted. So, so yeah, people coming in from the outside of school to, to offer support and help and things like that is really, really useful. And, uh, and, you know, people really need to listen to them because I was, I was, I, I list, had a speech and language therapist for um, a young man with Down syndrome in my first school that I taught at. Um, and his speech and language therapist used to come in and speak to his one-to-one and I used to let her go and I wasn't really that engaged in it. And I'm now looking back eight years on thinking, God, I really should have found out what she told him to do. And I should have seen how I could have, in, you know, put that into the lesson with everybody so that he didn't have to go out to do the speech and language therapy with the one-to-one, the sessions that she'd left him to do and the homework and the sheets, you know, it would have been nice if he could have done that with a couple of his friends. It would have been nice if I could have integrated that into our, in our English lesson or, or something like that. So yeah, there's a lot of work to be done with collaborative effort and making sure that everybody's working together and that people aren't doing it because you're coming in a week later and are doing it five minutes before you walk in the door that they really are doing it every day and, you know, walking, walking the walk as well as talking the talk. Yeah, no, I completely, I completely can, can relate to that. Carly, one of the things that I loved and what led me to you was your, your Instagram. We found each other on Instagram (laughs) and I just love how you're using really motivating and innovative ways to engage your learners. So I would just love to talk to you a little bit about what kinds of, you know, materials you're using and technology you're using besides the AAC devices um, to really get kids communicating because I, I'm just so impressed with your social media and all the things that, that the school that you're at is doing to engage learners? Well, obviously first on social media is a snapshot of our days in school and we all have good days and bad days. I didn't follow any of my lesson plans today because it snowed um, and that's more important. And trying to drag the children back from the windows to engage them in something that I wrote down a couple of weeks ago is never going to work. So um, it's important to follow the children's line of interest. And the line of interest was it was snowing outside. So we went and played in the snow. Um, So, you know, that's that's the type of thing that, you know, I would hope that Ofsted would appreciate if they were in and looking at us. Um, we do in my classroom where I'm really fortunate in that the head teacher has said that communication is the most important thing and that that's paramount. So I'm actually not teaching 
curriculum per se this year. Um, so I'm not teaching English for teaching English's sake and I'm not teaching maths for teaching maths sake. We're doing lots of highly motivating things that the children are going to be interested in and following their line of, of interest. And, you know, it might seem like they have a lot of free time and they have a lot of opportunities to wander and opportunities to be self-directed. But those are the moments in which they're going to have more interest in and be more willing and open to communicate in if they've gone and chosen a game off the shelf they're not games fun games they're all educational games if they're putting a jigsaw together that's got a picture of someone from frozen on it of elsa you know they're learning fine motor skills they're learning to be playing as part of a team you know they're learning strategic things the science the technology there's all sorts of things that we can say that they can do whilst they're doing that activity but talking about it while they're doing it and focusing on something and having AAC as you know just next to them i find really really important I also find we watch the news every day um, and I find I, th I think it's really important. It, personally, for me, I think it's really important that the children know what's going on in the world around them. And um, so we watch Newsround, which is um, a six minute show that the BBC put on. And it's it's current affairs. It's it's absolutely what is going on in the world, but given to them in bite sized chunks that are two or three minutes long and sort of punctuated with really funny and cool news stories. So today there was um, somebody who'd swum with uh, the biggest shark in the world that was 50 years old and it was a female. And then that prompted about a 20 minute discussion as to why, why you would or why you would not choose to swim with a shark, um, which it's not the type of thing that I can write down is going to happen because I have no idea what's going to happen on the news each day. And sometimes it can be six minutes. Everything on the news is pretty boring, pretty standard. Um, Brexit is pretty much on every single day at the moment. <laughs> um, when the Scot Scottish referendum happened last year, that was on almost every day. And we watched it and I said, has anyone got anything to say about that? and was greeted with silence and pretty bored faces. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's important that quite a lot of our children have physical disabilities as well as complex communication needs, as well as learning difficulties. And within their homes, a lot of attention is focused on them. Not necessarily the whole world revolves around them, but there is a lot of time within their families spent making sure that their needs are, are, are looked after and what have you. And I think it's important that they know that there's other people out there in the world doing things and they need to, I don't want any of my kids, verbal or any, anybody with communication um, difficulties, to be sitting around their dining table with their family and one of their family say, oh, isn't it awful about what's happening in da 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 today? And them not be able to contribute to that conversation. I want them to be able to say, I've got an opinion on that. I think it's awful too. Or no, I disagree with you. Or if there's silence did you hear about the person who swam with a 60 foot shark? Not 60 foot, that's far too big. <laughs> the, um, the 50 year old shark that may have been six meters. I can't quite remember. Um, you know, so I want them to be able to engage in the world around them and in their own lives and not be passive. I want them to be an active participant in their families in their friends in their social groups and in their life. Um, rather than listening to people talk about stuff that they, they have no knowledge of. So we watch that first thing in the morning and sometimes that springboards the whole day's worth of activities and everything else that I was thinking about doing just goes out of the window because they're really interested in it. Um, last year we got talking about rhinos and poaching and rhino tusks and if you had to have a part of your body sawn off, which one would it be and why? Um, you know, would you like someone to sell that for a profit? Um, and all sorts of things. And, you know, we, I have to be aware that I am dealing with teenagers and we do have a responsibility to make sure that they are accessing age appropriate materials, mm -hmm. but to a level that is appropriate to them cognitively. Um, and making sure that they, they can contribute to society. They can, they do have things to talk about. They can know what's going on in the world and be able to comment on what they think about Theresa May at the moment. You know, that that's, that's what everybody else gets to do. Why should they not get to do that? Um, so engaging in society, engaging in what's going on in the world, keeping an eye on the news. Um, we also have a lot of animals. We have a lot of pets. Um, and I think that employability and making sure that our children have the skills that they need to join the workforce when they leave us at 19 is really important. Communication is a big part of that, but also they need to be able to be working as part of a team, know that they can you know, be delegated to, see things through, celebrate task fulfillment. Um, and as part of that, we have a jobs list on the wall and everybody has a job each week. If they don't do it, 
you know, the classroom, if they don't empty the recycling bin, we are going to be knee deep in recycling. If they don't feed the guinea pigs, the guinea pigs will die. If they don't clean out the fish, you know, we're not going to be able to see them because the tank's going to be dirty. And knowing that they have that responsibility and that, you know, the knowledge that they know what the jobs are that they need to do for that task. And they need to see that through because if they don't, the whole class will suffer. So all of these things that we do, you know, there's a focus on, on communication around them, but they are tasks that need to be done anyway. Um, but they're opportunities for finding things to talk about whilst we're doing them, you know, cleaning out the guinea pig cage it's not particularly glamorous. Um, and there's loads of opportunities for, you know, this is stinky, this is disgusting, I need a pair of gloves, this smells, how can one guinea pig do so much poo? Um, you know, there's, there's loads of lovely opportunities to talk about those types of things and we just need to make sure that we're using them. Absolutely. And I think that kind of the common thread that I'm hearing is that you need to be flexible. You know, yeah. we can go into a day thinking we're going to do one thing and teach one thing and follow a lesson plan. But if something arises, that's a great communication opportunity and it's highly motivating and it's functional and useful, just going with that and kind of, yeah. um, you kind of have to fly by the seat of your pants in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. Do that a lot. Do that a lot. I'd spend most, most of my, most of my preparatory time and evaluation time is spent in my car. Um, so when I'm in the, in the car and then what, right. Okay. So this is what's going to happen. This child's got a physio appointment and this child's got a wheelchair services appointment. This child's having Botox today. So they're not going to be in today. Right. So this person can work with this person and this person can work with it. And then, and then this is going to happen. And then that person's got a drum lesson. This will be a really good time to do this because they won't be in the room. And then that child can go into the multi-sensory room. And then I turn up, walk through the door, two members of staff are absent. The child who was supposed to be going to the hospital appointments got canceled. Everything gets thrown in the air. And my most my most commonly used frame is, well, that's a spanner in the works, isn't it? And that, you know, the children are now sort of going, oh, what are we going to do now? Where are we? Where are, well, who's going to work with me? And, you know, then we have to work it out together and, and having those sort of problem solving skills and being able to negotiate with each other and go, well, actually, I want to work with her and you're working with her now so when she's finished with you can she come and work with me and and then having to work out who's who's going to take that child to the bathroom and who's going to take that child for their lunch and then being actively participating in that rather than just letting people push them around you know I don't want you to take me to the bathroom I want her to take me to the bathroom that's important that's that's a right that we are all afforded and we need to be making sure that our children are making those decisions as well um so yes flexibility is key in our school in our classroom and I I'm not, I don't think I'd be wrong in saying in all schools um, and settings. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And just life, right? Like yes. we all need to learn yeah. how to be flexible. And some yeah. of us are probably, it's a lot easier. It comes a lot more naturally than others, but I think it's a really important skill because life never goes according to plan. Uh, exactly. So you can have the best plan in the world, but unfortunately you need to be able to adapt. Yeah. Um, I can be super relaxed in school and I seem, you know, cool as a cucumber. Things happen. Oh, never mind. It doesn't matter. I'm not like that at home. Very organized, very OCD. And I don't, I don't quite know how I manage to compartmentalize them in my two, my two heads. And um, when I take that hat off and get home and I'm like, boom, 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 let's get that done. Let's get that done. Let's get that done. Come on, come on, come on, come on. And then in school, I'm like, it doesn't matter. We can do that tomorrow. It doesn't matter. Yeah, fine. Yeah, we can do that. There's no problem. Yeah, we can change that. Yeah, we'll go to a different room. Yeah, we'll watch this chick hatch instead of doing that. That's fine. <laughs> I know. It's so funny how we can we can sometimes compartmentalize some parts of our life, but not others, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, Carly, I'm so excited that we were able to chat with you today. I think you offer a really unique perspective and you're doing amazing work. Um, and so I'm just really excited that you were able to share all of these things with us. Um, one of the things that we ask the people that come on our show is if you had a billboard that everyone could read, what would it say? Ooh, talk to the children the way they speak. Yes. Yeah. I love that. So don't, 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 one of the, the, the main thing that I use in all of my training sessions is the, I, I can't, I'm not going to be able to reference them because I don't know where I've got it from, but you know, the one that says spoken language, spoken language, and then the happy child in the middle, and then spoken language and aided language coming out and the confused child in the middle. That's yeah. my sort of go-to. Yes. Yeah, so if I had to do an elevator pitch or when people say to me, what's AAC? Because they walk around school and they see us all with our lanyards and they see the AAC board and they see all these children walking around and, and driving around with, with these contraptions that they think are TVs, um, you know, and they say, well, what is this? And well, they ask someone else in school actually is what happens. They never come to me first. And then they go, 
go down the corridor, speak to Carly, she'll tell you. Um, and my sort of, if, if you can't speak to a French child English because they won't understand you, um, you need to speak to them the way that they speak. And so if they speak using AAC, that's how you should talk to them. So that's what my billboard would say. I, I, I love that billboard. I, I think that's a really great answer to that question. Um, so Carly, how can people find you online? Because I've referenced your social media, which I love. Um, where can people find you? Um, so we are on Facebook, Sandfield Park School. We're on Twitter, I think it's Sandfield School. And we're on Instagram as well, Sandfield Park School. Um, and if there's anything that's come out from any of these, if anybody wants, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a business, so I can't give people stuff. But if there's anything that anybody sees on any of our social media channels that I've been using and wants a copy of, please get in touch with me. Please email me. I'm more than happy. If, any, if I've made something and it saves somebody else having to do it, teaching is legalized theft. No one needs to reinvent the wheel. If I've spent time doing something and it's going to save someone else a Saturday afternoon from doing it, it means that they can go for a walk with their dog or spend time with their kids. Other people have done that for me and they've saved me time. So I'm very, very happy to share resources. Um, so if there's something that somebody sees me using online and wants to know if I found it and I can, where I found it so I can sign post them to it, or if I've made it myself, very, very happy to share it. Um, I don't want everybody to be doing the same thing over and over again. It's just a complete waste of everybody's time. If we totted up the amount of time that everybody spent and then you found something online that was pretty similar to what you've just created, um, it would be a lot of hours and that's a waste of everybody's life. <laughs> so yeah, no problem. Amazing. And I think that you're exactly right. We have uh, a lot of people who are doing really great things. And I think that one of the things I love the most about you know, this AAC community is that everyone's so willing to share, um, because it just brings everybody else up. Right. Um, so I just, I appreciate that. And I know that our listeners will appreciate that too. Um, Carly, thank you so much for coming on. I'm just really excited. I think that, you know, you, like I said, offer a really great perspective. Um, and so I really appreciate you joining us. Thank you for having me. It's been really, really interesting. It's been interesting to have to hone what I need to say about this um, in order to go onto a podcast because obviously it's something that I do all of the time. Um, and the questions that you're asking me are probably questions that I've answered sporadically throughout many years, but actually having to answer them all in such a short period of time has really made me focus and think about what we're doing. And even, even while I've been doing this, I've been writing things like Monday, do this, um, because I've just said it and I'm like, oh, that'll be a good thing to do. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, thank you again for coming on, uh, for talking with tech. I'm Rachel Madel joined by Carly Hines. Uh, we will talk to you guys next week. You're listening to the Exceptional Podcast Network.